Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cana Connection podcast. On today's podcast, our host, Rob Cranston, will be talking with our guest, Laura Albert, about all things analytics. And we're going to let Rob take it away. So take it away, Rob. Hey, Hey, Laura. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. We are a special guest with Laura Albert. She's a professor in the David Gustafson Department Chair of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's a lot there. Um, awesome responsibility. She's also the 2023 Informs president. Um, she is the uh, founder of Punk Rock Operations Research Blog, and she's a heck of an athlete. She, I know, loves sports, but also absolutely adores this operational research community, industrial engineering, and academics. Um, again, good to see you. Good to see you too, and thank you for that nice introduction. <laughs> Yes. Well, let's get into it. Um, so give us that perspective of you and how you got involved into this world of ops research and, and where you are today. That's a great uh, that's a great question. And I wasn't born knowing about operations research or even really knowing about it until graduate school, maybe as an undergraduate a little bit. I did grow up fascinated with traffic and efficiency. And um, I should say that I grew up in suburban Chicago. So there's a lot of traffic there and I really don't like waiting in line. And I was always thinking about how to design systems that would be more efficient. So it's kind of primed to like operations research when I first saw it. Um, Then I went to college, the University of Illinois. Uh, My major is um, what they call general engineering, which is now industrial systems engineering there. Mm -hmm. And I did take an operations research course as an undergraduate. And um, I still remember, you know, seeing the simplex method for the first time and understanding branch and bound. And it was, you know, kind of beautiful, Um, but it wasn't love at first sight with operations Uh, research, I have to say. It did motivate me to take an optimization course as my senior elective. And that's really when um, the love took off. I mean, just that we could solve these problems with multiple variables, all of which could change, and we'd have constraints to the problem. And we could do that just using mathematical algorithms, solve them solve it optimally or with um, other types of heuristics. And we got to work on the design part, the modeling part, but then also programming um, some algorithms. And for me, I was kind of hooked. Uh-huh. And then I went on to graduate school eventually getting a PhD in industrial engineering. Mm -hmm. And I studied applied optimization and worked with Shelton Jacobson, who's still at the University of Illinois, where I got my PhD and we studied aviation security. And it was an emerging application in OR. There was no roadmap at all. And I found that really exciting to work in applications that might have policy impact. Still Mm -hmm. working in those areas today. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I also joined Informs. And a big part of my love of of operations research came from finding community. And that community, of course, came through professional circles, but a lot of those professional circles interact through professional societies such as Informs. And I've been a member for more than 20 years, um, for a long time. Oh, wow. And yeah. yeah. A, I, my advisor sat me ch- down really early on in my PhD and said, you know, I should join Informs. It would yeah. do so much over my career. And he was right. That's the, uh, and for the audience out there that, that may not know, that is the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. Um, awesome place. But keep going. This is, this is fabulous. Yeah. So I'm still, in terms of my evolution and operations research, I've, I really like working on applied problems in mostly public sector applications, critical infrastructure, homeland security and thinking about emerging mm-hmm. applications. Um, so I've studied a lot of public safety, which is probably not an emerging application at this point, mm-hmm. but I've been studying public safety and where it intersects with the opioid epidemic, which is very mm-hmm. new for our community. Um, also cyber um, So I study election resilience outside of issues of um, kind of political districting. So I'm like sort of interested in everything else. Although political distressing is very yeah. interesting on its own, but I think there's a lot We're of- We're going to talk about that in a moment. What an awesome background. I, I And awesome being uh, not just biased because at Kena, we, we love in that space of um, solving problems, applied analytics to those problems, modeling, doing um, those type of 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 efforts that, that really are today are being highlighted in the start of an academic career for someone 
who now has a hu huge demand out there for this background in operations and research. Um, so with that, um, what's your take? I mean, I, that, I, that being a positive outcome, but what continues, I think, in, in terms of student to, to the world as they enter the business world? Um, what's your what's your take on the outcome, or I'm sorry, the the opportunities and and the state of operations research? The opportunities are really good right now. From what we see in academia, that the art graduates are really sought out in industry, and that's great news. Our skills are in high demand. Um, basically, you know, employers that want to take data and turn it into actionable information, do something differently with it. Um, make better decisions. If people are good at that, they're going to have a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people with in operations research have that know how and have those skills. Um, you know, many of my department's alumni are actually in the C suite as well. So there's opportunities there. Um, and I, yeah. you know, I talk to a lot of folks at Informs conferences and the analytics conference in the spring. And so it's not just operations research, it's kind of leading, it's leading in those spaces. And one of my graduates of my department, you know, told me that, you know, industrial engineering and particularly the operations research side of it that focuses on decision making, mm. you know, is ultimately how to make decisions and how to make them well. And that's something that every organization values. Like, well, that's a great selling point for operations research right there. And um, yeah. I'm really seeing that. Um, it's a good time to get into operations research. Well, you know, it dawned on me. Um when I was going through our questions, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is, um, how do you, how do you teach me? I call it going from math to English, but really making sure that, that, that whether it's an optimized solution, um, or, or other, how, how, how do you teach the explanation to maybe a, someone who's a journeyman, someone who is non-ops research, but needs to understand what that output means? There's a few places we do that in the curriculum. I think that's an area that we always need to be working on in terms of continual improvement. In the undergraduate curriculum, some of that is in these group projects. There's a lot of team-based education that goes on culminating in a senior design project. And this is for all accredited engineering programs. This is something that we have and that communication to a broader audience mm. is a big piece of that where maybe their sponsors come in for their presentations. They interact with their sponsors a lot. So they're actually getting the hands-on communication. In terms of our kind of other degree programs and other courses, things that you know, master's and PhD students might take, um, we definitely have been working on courses that have components where they build on that through case studies and projects, of course. Um, we also started a data visualization course uh, that really thinks about telling that story mm -hmm. visually and with mm -hmm. data and strengthening you know, all sides of that, not just the communications. Yeah. Um, and lately, because I have an industrial advisory board in my department, some of the board members, which are mostly alumni, actually they're all alumni right now, talked about communication and you, some of them come back and they come to these presentations and give students feedback. And it means a lot more to oh, our cool. students when they get the feedback from somebody in industry versus their professor. And they really step it up and uh, take their communication more seriously. Um, so these are some lessons learned that we have. Um, and of course, with, with PhD students, we can do a little bit more since there's so much hands-on mentoring. Mm -hmm. and they have opportunities to present their posters in a variety of settings, which really helps with uh, communication. I love that there's that feedback loop back to the mm -hmm. students from professionals. I think that's so invaluable. Um, and I know a lot of what you and how you... Um, not just teach, but also, um, you know, present into the community of ops research. Um, I, I, I'll keep telling folks out, you know, the, the punk rock operations research blog. If you really want to know what Laura's up to, I mean, like it is, it's really cool to see the trap. I mean, you just got back from Chile, um, again, a professional development there of the Infors 2023, that conference of the International Federation of Operations Research Societies. I mean, you're in it. So, and specifically, um, some projects you've worked on. One I know, um, which is really interesting, the National Science Foundation um, Safe and Trustworthy Computing Grant Work. Tell us a little bit about that. 
That's a, uh, happy to talk about it. It's actually my second grant in it. So I'm going to talk to you yeah. about kind of both projects together both. because they're synergistic. Yeah. And, you know, initially this started with a collaboration with Sandia National Laboratories a decade ago, actually interested in um, cybersecurity and how do you get the most bang for your buck in terms of mitigating the most risk across the life cycle? And how do you structure that mathematically? How do we think about that? How do we move away from simple policies that don't actually reduce the risk to something that does actually focus on reducing risk. And so ultimately that work, you know, you know, advanced our knowledge of how to make those types of decisions. Uh, but the decisions were really focused on, you know, these binary decisions of like, what's the right mix of security mitigations in various settings. And, you know, implementing and deploying security mitigations for cybersecurity isn't really a binary decision. It's more mm -hmm. of a process. And that's mm -hmm. one of the limitations that we saw with that work that, um, you know, did kind of, did advance our knowledge, but there was a lot more work to do is what I would say. And we are really focusing now on moving past that, okay, you decided what security mitigations you want to deploy. How do you actually roll those out? And that becomes more of a, a series of decisions over time. How do you deploy and coordinate these decisions? Um, and it really came about by being in constant contact with um, collaborators who are very generous with their time, talking about what the security means, security controls mean to them and how they mm. have to implement them. And it's very time consuming for an organization. And there's more and more that they're asked to do and budgets don't keep pace. So we're looking at how to actually you know, manage and risk and reduce the risk as much as possible with limited resources. But you don't just snap your fingers and say, okay, well, we've selected the security mitigation, it's done. You accept mm -hmm. to deploy it. And quite often um, we can find examples of breaches that occurred because a security, you know, solution was never fully deployed or a patch wasn't installed. And so the reality is to actually make a difference, we have to consider these these deployment decisions, which is really an operations research problem. Awesome. How, I'm just curious on that. Um, specific to how, is, how does training get kind of baked into that so that, again, you have that, that transition, if you will, of, you know, experts that are looking at and or are trained to be able to look at data the way you're, you know, recommending. Sure. Um, we're not specifically studying training, mm -hmm. but there's training of employees and there's also training yeah. of like all the users of the system. And mm -hmm. so something like, you know, training all the users and how to deploy that. Um, I have to go through cybersecurity testing every year. There's a piece that requires somebody's labor and time yeah. to make sure that that actually happens and, and trying to understand how to fit that in with other priorities. That That's more of what we're trying to consider. Yeah. I gotcha. Okay. No, thanks for that. Um, this kind of transitions into this world that, that, uh, we've talked about in the past and, um, and I, and it, it you and I were on a panel years ago that had, it was really cool. And, it was, and that's where I, I actually got a chance to, to meet you and, um, just, just listen in on, on, um, this bridge into what is, and this was some of the topics, but in the smart cities and the world of where technology infrastructure and infrastructure use of, what are becoming and continue to be adaptation of innovation, um, whether that's in a, a smart um, security around a, a city's um, infrastructure, um, or sets of infrastructure, um, or if that is in, you know, you, you name it, in, in different types of net zero projects to et cetera. But let me ask you, in that, in, in kind of highlighting, what do you see did, uh, in, in terms of probably more of the security structure around what becomes this, um, you know, rural urban integration of, of really energy? Um, I know this isn't a place where it's a total focus concentration, but I think it all, it's the, the data side of that and how data is being extracted to create decision making at different levels, um, and then the connectors to different systems of different agencies. So, um, with that being said, were some of those, and I, I think it's the connectors of systems and connecting um, different agencies. Is that uh, was that something that you guys had a chance to look at? Yeah, this whole smart cities application area is really interesting and exciting. And actually, I've taught case studies on this in the classroom and have been following along. And you're right, there has to be a lot of interconnectivity and 
as residents of a city or yeah. a place, we're starting to see kind of the smart and connected pieces start to come together. And I think we all realize that there is a long way to go in part because there's so many different agencies that have their own data mm -hmm. and it's hard to get them to interact. So there's like this really basic systems piece to it. But the bigger picture really is how do we leverage data and technology to make you know the residents way of life better. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of challenges that we have to address before we totally get that totally get there. This is um, basically a city needs to be very responsive to improve infrastructure, services, operations. Some of this is just having you know reliable broadband or reliable cellular service, which mm -hmm. isn't a reality in a lot of urban centers right now. So there is that like IT infrastructure backbone that's not quite where it needs to be yet. Um, and I will say that the world has become a lot more urban, especially outside the United States. Mm -hmm. And this really drastically changes how we think about smart cities and integration and power. Some of the topics that you yeah. uh, mentioned, I think more than half the world now lives in urban areas. And in the developing world, it's, it's becoming... Um, the, the urbanization is uh, is occurring much faster than it is here in the United States. So there's also a lot of challenges when you just have large groups of people living in concentrated areas. And it's particularly challenging for issues like transportation because there's mm -hmm. a lot more congestion and a lot more opportunities for public transportation. Here in the United States, it's really piecemeal in that we have local public transportation, but we might have like federal you know, transportation as well. And those systems don't always talk to each other and share data really easily to create like a smart and connected mm -hmm. uh, transportation network. Uh, there's also questions about public services and safety and also citizen engagement. I talked about election resilience. Right. Part yeah. of that is yeah, people exactly. to care <laughs> and to, to right. vote and participate in the civic processes. Then of course there's sustainability, which is kind of really hard to achieve because a lot of the advances happen in, in isolation. And I'm really been looking a lot at the integration and how we can have um, different smart and connected solutions support sustainability. And yeah, so there's a lot of questions that come up in this space. I mean, one of which is privacy of data. So I talked about different agencies sharing data right. and you start combining data sets, you can start identifying whose data that is. And so there are some real challenges um, to address that are, I think, really important to citizens. A big one is just interoperability because there's different standards and a lot of different systems. So you can imagine standardization is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, another big challenge is resilience to disasters, I think. Having a solution that works day to day doesn't really give you any insight into what to do when there's an earthquake or a hurricane is about to strike, um, et cetera. And citizens have really different needs in those situations and it's temporal, but every minute really does count and is important. Yeah, so with all that, there's a few grand challenges. <laughs> We've got a lot well, of work to do. I, I know, don't we? And I and I and I and truly I love that you've got the use cases that's being presented in smart cities that you're yeah, you're, you're you're testing the the kind of the the thought outside the you know, or really out the ability to, to to think through can, that whole interconnectability that, uh, that that you just mentioned. Those are great thoughts. Yeah, we do. We we've got a lot of a lot of a lot of work ahead of us, especially with infrastructure bill and infrastructure design and how that's working. Public private partnerships, as you, you know, as we talked through here. Um, well, let me, let me ask this one. I, so this is, I love, so I love this. So this is so cool. I loved your mention. Um, again, this is in punk rock ops research blog that you had mentioned this, um, your mention of technological change being ecological would please, I'd love to hear more about that thinking and, um, and, and beyond. Yeah. Um, this is from a blog post I wrote about, Mm -hmm. And it was a quote from a lecture by Neil Postman um, in 1997. And he gave this lecture at the Art Center in Denver, Colorado. And it was called Five Things We Need to Know About Technological Change. And one thing was that he mentioned was that technological change is ecological. And the quote that I really like is, 
In the year 1500, after the printing press was invented, you did not have old Europe plus the printing press. You had a different Europe. And it just really hooked me because I had been thinking about artificial intelligence and some of these grand challenges for the operations research community. And it really changed how I think about what it is that we actually do and how it affects the mm. world. And I think sometimes we don't give it enough space of that, you know, though, if we really do solve grand ch challenges, they should be more ecological in, in nature. And just acknowledging that changes how I think about what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. how we solve it, the importance of really understanding equity in a lot of solutions, um, because that was actually another one on this list as well. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. These t ecological changes don't hit everybody the same way, um, but also engineering education. And, you know, we have all this pressure to fit more technical material into the curriculum. We already talked about communication and the need to communicate yeah. results, and I have to fight to get that in, in and to improve it. But it really does change how we think about teaching uh, the more technical material and that we have to understand what that impact is and what do engineers need to know about that. And some of that is working in teams where you can address some of these ecological um, aspects of it as a team, not you as an individual that has mm -hmm. to be responsible for everything. Um, but I'm a real fan of engineering ethics and making sure that that has a place in the curriculum. And we've been expanding what we do here at Wisconsin thinking about data, but also its place in systems and society and understanding some of these unintended consequences. And risk management seems like it's a really great topic that everybody should know about it. And, and at the end, yeah. you know, and I continue to think about this, is that we really need more data and AI literacy across the population uh -huh. as on. well, because I think everybody <laughs> needs to be aware of this ecological change. And mm -hmm. definitely in operations research, we need to do our part. But I think, you know, everybody's going to have to be working with these uh, in these smart cities that we just talked mm -hmm. about. And, um, you yeah. know, everybody yeah. needs to be prepared. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Love it. I, I in those thought provoking pieces on ethics to AI policy, the the those type of discussions. I know you're in those quite a bit. And I know down in Chile, you were on a panel that was specific to that. Um, so it all, I, I, I mean, from a, how, how the ecological thinking is tethered is such a cool way to show that, Hey, there's, there actually is a larger purpose also, I think mm -hmm. for what becomes an end state of something that could be fixed, um, per, perhaps, but, um, Okay, so I've been talking about Punk Rock Operations Research Blog. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I started a blog ages ago, and I started my first tenure track position in 2006 and kind of knew that I was going to start a blog because blogging was so cool back there. It was all, it was all the rage. The, mm -hmm. uh, ABC, the, the television channel, their person of the year in 2004 was were bloggers because bloggers mm -hmm. are so cool. I think bloggers are still cool, but I might be in the minority now. <laughs> no. And I really like writing, uh, which is good because professors mm -hmm. have to do a lot of writing. It really you know, organizes my thoughts and leads to more critical thinking. So in my first ten year on the tenure track in April, 2007, I started my blog and it was really to try to evangelize to students at my university, which is Virginia Commonwealth University at the time. I was like, oh, I'll start this blog and maybe some of the students here will read it and mm. will think about OR as a major. And that didn't happen at all, but mm. you know, people did discover it. And, and there's like different camps of people. And I've met so many students who are now professors and even tenured professors at this point who were introduced to operations research in my blog. And I'm so touched by this. Uh, but I've, it's also read by professionals and the general public. Um, actually discovers it. And it's an opportunity to provide some science and engineering to the general public to improve their science literacy. And uh, over time, actually, reporters have found me as well, and they need an expert, and <laughs> they found the blog. Yeah. Um, but I, I've kept with it because I, I really like blogging. At this point, I see that it makes it does something for the community and I'm happy to do it. And I really just write for myself, I would say, because I really enjoy doing that. 
Um, but one thing that kept me going, it, especially in the beginning years, was that there were so few female science bloggers. Mm. There was uh, not a lot of representation. So I felt like it was good to do my part. And I still feel pretty good about that today. And I really do find that I like blogging because as much as I like micro blogging, I have a lot more to say and there's more content to pull in, especially when I can pull in videos of lectures or links mm. to other materials. But I'm mm -hmm. um, giving myself more space to, to mm. think about a topic and, and to write about it is uh, is great to do on blogs. It's a great platform for that. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm still going. Yeah, you are. And I, I, I right. I mean, I, it's really, it's thought provoking. It's got a lot of, um, just, just wonderful, wonderful content. Um, let me, let's really quick, put your informs president hat on. Wanted to ask you, um, you know, the state of informs and just this, this continued influx, as we talked about of the OR community of, of, of a larger population getting, um, into and educated and, and now professionals. Um, so tell us how are things going? Great. Well, first of all, I'm going to introduce INFORMS. And it does, if people aren't familiar yeah, with it, yeah, it's the yeah. Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. It has about 12,000 members. And it's a premier association for industry professionals and academics who apply science, math, technology, and analytics to solve the world's most critical challenges. And we try to make smarter decisions for a better world. And that's kind of what INFORMS is all about. And INFORMS has given me so much over my career. As I mentioned, this is why I'm still a member. It's an honor to serve as president. And what INFORMS really does for me is provide a community of practice and a network so that I can stay abreast of the latest and greatest, mostly in academic research for me. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of industry professionals who are also uh, members. I should say that INFORMS is US-based and it also has an international membership. So there are members from around the world. And we have members from industry, government, and also students. And a couple more things about the, the um, INFORMS. It's a, it's a really big organization with two big annual conferences. One is the annual meeting which has, which will be meeting in October in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And there'll probably be six to 7,000 attendees there. So quite a big conference with a little bit of something for everyone. And the spring we have the analytics or the business analytics conference, which is a smaller conference of about a thousand. And the next conference will be held in Orlando in April of 2024. And that is definitely more of an industry and government focused conference. And I will be a both, mm -hmm. and both are fantastic. Yay. And I will say that. It, it, <laughs> no, I go ahead. I, I just, it's a, it's a wonderful place. We've had a lot of caners who have attended mm -hmm. over many, many years and who know you. And I know, you know, some of the, the, the folks we have, and they just absolutely rave about the continued um, involvement that they can and, and opportunity to take uh, part of different committees, et cetera. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for supporting uh, INFORMS through Kena. Yeah. It's great when um, different companies actually sponsor memberships for their employees and support travel to the conferences. That really does make a difference yeah. because the community is what we make it. So when people are and our members are able to show up and take advantage, it really makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Okay, now we're getting to the most important and one of our last questions. And uh, for those that, that do want to see a list of this, um, these kind of um, these, uh, we always have resolutions, all of us come up. And uh, one of Laura's happens to be uh, this, and that is, uh, and I'm going to ask her, are you eating more leafy green vegetables? <laughs> Yes. The answer is yes. I love the list. I mean, it's so great because they're like, hey, this is so practical. <laughs> I can actually do it this year. <laughs> I try to make some really easy but meaningful resolutions Soft every balls. year. Yeah. Ones that I can actually follow up on. Yeah. Um, one of my evergreen New Year's resolutions is to have more leafy green vegetables. And that is a shout out to my mom who always insisted that we have vegetables for dinner every night, preferably mm. something green. And I looked into this because as a kid, I did not like the green vegetables all the time, but I did look into it. And we know that green vegetables are really good for you, especially leafy green ones. And between Thanksgiving and Christmas, I don't always stick to it. I am tempted by Christmas mm. cookies and various holiday fare, which is not yeah. all that healthy. So I 
try to make that an evergreen New Year's resolution um, to just get into a better habit when the, the new year starts. And I think it's good. It's actually really challenging. I've learned to just resume habits when they get interrupted by holidays or vacation or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and I did get a big tub of leafy greens, the mixed greens, when I got back from that conference in Chile that you mentioned. <laughs> because I had uh, two it's international gosh. conferences and in a <laughs> yeah. row. And so, you know, I'm not eating in my home. And it was, and I was thinking Jeez. about that, especially in Chile. I'm like, I kind of really need to focus on reestablishing my my good habits when I get back. Right. Because they, they do fall away after a long time conference so oh um, my gosh I, I'm, I I'm almost done with the tub oh <laughs> do it well that is i love it it's so great okay how can how can the audience out there reach you and contact you well there's a few best ways i am on social media a lot so that's my favorite way mm -hmm. um mostly i go use laura albert phd is a way to find me on twitter instagram threads now um, and then also uh, my blog and LinkedIn. So my blog is punkrockor.com. And uh, you can also leave me a comment that would. Uh, yes. Okay. Punkrockor.com, everybody. Go to it. That's Laura Albert. She is a pro. I, and I just, every bit of how uh, you continue to, to teach the next generation and current generation of ops research and engineers is just inspiring continue to to be that and uh, we look forward to having you back on and maybe we can get to that election ballot and election type of discussion uh, thank you again to laura albert for joining us on today's cana connection podcast if you would like to get in touch with her please hit up her blog uh, this is koa beam for rob cranston and the rest of the cana connection podcast crew reminding you to analyze assess and execute and we'll catch you next time